And uh, let me invite you to take your Bible. And if you don't have one with you, there should be one right around you somewhere there in the pew. Um, and uh, we always uh, like you to look right on in the Word of God so you can uh, follow along. But I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Song of Solomon this morning. Song of Solomon. It follows the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to be in the book of, of uh, Song of Solomon. When you're uh, preaching a series on the gospel from every book of the Bible, then you kind of got to do every book of the Bible, including Song of Solomon. Now, the reason I say that is because if, if you know anything about the Bible, you know that Song of Solomon is a love poem, it's love poetry, and it is, uh, it's explicit. It's a, a man talking about his wife and a wife talking about her husband. As a matter of fact, in the Jewish tradition, um, Jewish parents do not recommend that their children read the book of Song of Solomon until they're 30 years old. So you can take that for what it's worth. Uh, I was married at 21 and uh, my wife was 19. I think we probably marry a little bit younger than they did in Bible times and in, in an ancient time. It probably depends upon the circumstance, but um, this isn't, uh, I, I want to point this out, just because there's, there's explicit material about a married relationship in the book of Song of Solomon does not mean this is a dirty book of the Bible. As a matter of fact, uh, God's not influenced by the pornographic society that we live in today where things are so base and, and uh, uh, demoralized and, and everything like that. As a matter of fact, all throughout the book of Song of Solomon, there's one thing that's consistent with every stanza of poetry in this book of the Bible, and that is garden imagery. In every, in every chapter of the book of Song, of Song of Solomon, you read specific things regarding to flowers, and trees and garden imagery. And I believe in my heart that the main reason why that is so is because Song of Solomon is a glimpse into marriage the way God created it. And when God created marriage, He created it in the Garden of Eden with a man and a woman, Adam and Eve. He brought uh, Eve to Adam and presented her to him. And uh, that they, uh, she was to be his wife he was to be her husband. Uh, he gave the commandment, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That commandment was not to Adam and Eve because they had no father and mother to leave and cleave to, but they did get the cleave part. And they were there in the Garden of Eden. And I think the Song of Solomon is written by Solomon to be a glimpse into the intimacy and the glories of what God can, can provide in the boundaries of a marital relationship. And I want to tell you that intimacy is not bad, it's not wicked, it's not sinful, but God's very, very clear about this. It is to only be enjoyed in the boundaries of the marriage relationship. And outside of that, there's all kinds of vulnerabilities to problems and difficulties um, there's, there's brokenness, there's guilt, uh, there's, there's all manner of things that plague the conscience. But inside that committed marriage relationship, uh, the Bible would tell us in Hebrews chapter 13, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And so we have every reason when we're looking or when we were to read for our personal reading or whatever it might be, uh, to read the book of Song of Solomon with a holy perspective and not the unholy perspective of the world and the way everything is so tainted by sin. We're actually, in this morning's message, we're not going to look at the joys and the wonders of the marital relationship because what we're looking for is we're looking for Christ in this book of the Bible. Uh, we're looking for Him by picture, we're looking for Him by type, we're looking for something that would be revealed that would point to the gospel of, of our salvation that was to come. And I'm excited about what we're going to see here in the way that this story plays out. The title is The Song of Solomon, 
And he introduces in chapter 1, verse number 1, by saying, the song of songs. This is a Hebrew idiom that would basically be like saying the holy of holies or the king of kings. What he's saying is, this is the song that's above all songs. Of all songs that could be sung, this is the pinnacle. This is, this is the height. And the reason why is because this song really does show the kind of love that can only originate from God Himself. and that, I, That's why I'm saying we, we have no right to come to this Bible and just look at this from a sexual perspective because that's not what this is all about. This is showing a true and deep intimacy that goes beyond a, a physical thing uh, to a very deep spiritual love that only can originate from God Himself. And so Solomon starts off by saying this is the Song of Songs which is Solomon's. And that's why we have it titled in our Bibles, The Song of Solomon, because it's attributed to him. Now, I need you to understand something as we get into this this morning. This, would act, this poetry is actually written in dialogue format. What do I mean by written in dialogue format? Is that it, you could, and it actually helped me to do this when I was studying this passage of Scripture, Right out to the side, who's talking? Anybody ever been in a play and been handed a script? And you get that script and you look at it and it says somebody's name and then colon and then it has dialogue that they're speaking? Well, the entire book of Song of Solomon is written in first person, which means that someone is always speaking. And so what we have to do is we have to go in and figure out who's speaking because we don't have names out to the sides of verses that say, okay, now this person's speaking, and now this person's speaking. And so by context and, and by clues within the poetry, we find out who it is that's, who it is that's talking, who's speaking, and, and that can come in very handy. The principal characters are uh, one who's in, identified as the bridegroom or the bridegroom-to-be in the early part of the passage, and then we have the bride or the bride-to-be who's also identified for us as a Shulamite maiden, and she's a, she's a shepherdess out, in the, out on the hillside. And so then we have the daughters of Jerusalem are a group of attending ladies who are going to show up in the passage, and their primary jobs are going to be to help the bride prepare for her wedding day and also to provide accountability for her that she keeps her moral purity until marriage. And so you're going to see them speak up at times and, and, and uh, some things like that. And then later in the passage, you would hear from the bride's brothers and you would hear from the bride's mom uh, in, in the passage. And they have very small uh, speaking roles uh, in this particular book of the Bible. But it starts off with the voice of the, of the bride-to-be. And she says, uh, she expresses right off the bat, a longing for a real affection and a real intimacy. And she says in verse number 2, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine because of the savor of thy good ointments. Thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins love thee? Draw me, she says, draw me. We will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will... Be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine, and upright, the upright love thee. And then she says this. So the first thing she expresses here in this poetic language is a desire for intimacy and a desire for, for someone to pursue her. She wants to be pursued. She wants to be loved. She wants, she wants to know that someone loves her, but just as soon as she expresses this longing for a deep and intimate love, she takes a look at herself. And what she sees when she looks at herself to her own self is not very appealing. She says, I am black but com- comely. And by the way, this has nothing to do with race whatsoever here. She's actually going to explain here in a minute what she means when she says, I am black. But she says, I am black but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Keter, as the curtains of Solomon, 
What she's doing here is she's referring to the, uh, the, her skin from working out in the sun all the time has become like a, a tent canvas or, or curtains, uh, those tapestries. Her skin, she just looks at her skin as a very rough, sun-baked uh, kind of skin. In other words, what, when she takes a look at herself, she doesn't see herself as beautiful. She, she believes that there's a beauty that is within, but she goes on to say in verse number 6, she says, Look not upon me, because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. So she, what she's describing here is that to her own family, she probably is one of the youngest. I could just imagine this being the case. Anybody remember how David uh, was, the, was a son of Jesse? Many older brothers, but guess what got relegated to David? Well, go out and watch the sheep. Go do the hard uh, Middle Eastern outdoor labor. You know, you got to watch sheep out there 24-7. Somebody's got to stay out there with them. And so David's out there. He's the youngest, so he gets, he gets relegated to uh, the outdoor chores and, and activities. It would have been the same with her. Uh, she's, in, she's in this uh, familial position where her, her uh, older siblings have said, no, 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 you, get, you, you work the vineyards, and ultimately we're going to see that she's a shepherdess too. You go out and you watch the sheep. You do that outdoor Middle Eastern sun, uh, hard labor. And so she's out there, and while she's got this longing for this uh, deep and intimate relationship with a man, she looks at herself and says, you know, I don't know why any man would want me um, I've been so busy working outside in the hot sun. My skin is tough. I'm not soft and delicate uh, like many of the flowers in the garden and things like that. And so when she takes a look at herself, she does not see herself as someone that should be desired. In other words, as, as great as the longing is within for this deep, intimate relationship, she does not see herself worthy of that because of her, uh, the lifestyle that she's, that she's been in and been forced to leave. And then in verse number 7, it says, Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock, to rest at noon, for why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? And so she's speaking here, to someone who has shown an interest and she doesn't feel worthy of his interest, but boy, there's a great desire there to know where he is. And so he responds. He says, If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents. Now, I don't care who you are, if you're a woman and you don't think you look pretty and your man who you love, who you like, says, O oh, thou fairest among women, that does something in here. You know, uh, now let's be honest, men, we get trapped sometime by that question we dread, how do I look? You know, uh, I had a boss one time who uh, told me the story about uh, when his wife came in before they were going out on an evening outing, and she said, Honey, does this dress make me look fat? And he said, No, it's not the dress. <laughs> now that is not good, okay? That's just good solid preaching right there. Uh, he regretted that. To this day he regrets that. Uh, that that's, that's not the right response. But here she is and she's struggling with her own insecurities and she sees herself uh, according to how her, her appearance really is. But what I want to point out to you is that the man who has shown interest in her and she seeks after him, boy, he doesn't see her like she sees herself. 
As a matter of fact, I think we could say it like this. He looks beyond her fault and sees something that's much greater. He sees, he sees, uh, he sees somebody that's wonderful. You say, are, are you telling me this guy's blinded by love? I mean, does this guy look past the exterior? Well, we're told this, going back to that story of David being out uh, watching the flocks. Um, it, was, it was God who told Samuel that man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. And God saw something that was very valuable, or this man saw something that was very valuable, regardless of what her outside appearance looked like. I, I, let me just say this when it comes to outside appearance, and I, I want to say this particularly to the young ladies that we have in here. Uh, young ladies, if, if he doesn't think that you're beautiful like you are, he's not your guy. I'm just going to tell you that outright, okay? Any guy that wants to change your appearance to make you better in his sight, he has no right to change anything about you. He's not your man. Uh, when God brings that man along, boy, he's going to think you're the most beautiful person on earth just the way you are. No change is necessary. And you'd be, you'd be obliged to wait for God and His timing on that. Uh, so, so here's the man. He says, If thou knowest not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents. In other words, what he says is, he, he doesn't say, here's where I am, but he says, I've left you with evidence to know where you can find me. There are those along the way who can tell you how I can be found. Go and find them and you'll see the way. He says, I have compared thee, O oh my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. Now you say, man, that doesn't sound very good right there. This guy needs to learn how to sweet talk a little bit. Uh, but you don't know how majestic Pharaoh's chariots could really appear. I mean, that, that, that was a thing. I don't have time to go into it, but, but you would, uh, it, it's something. Thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewels, thy neck with chains of gold. We will make thee borders of gold with studs of silver. I want to skip on down uh, to uh, verse number, uh, chapter 2. Chapter 2. In chapter 2, the bridegroom-to-be starts off speaking and he says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. And uh, then she responds and she says, As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace thee. And then she says this, it's interesting, verse 7, I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please. And this, this phrase is going to repeat, be repeated several times because what has happened here in chapter 2 is that she has found him and they have entered into a betrothed relationship. What I mean by betrothed relationship means that they are they're locked in. Now see, in our culture today, what locks you in, and unfortunately that doesn't hold as well as it should in a lot of cases, but in our culture today what locks you in is marriage. It's that wedding ceremony. It's that time when you stand before God and witnesses and you say, I do, I do. And then you hold hands and you look one another in the eye and you say, this is the vow, this is the commitment that I'm making unto you. But in, in the Eastern culture of Bible days, they were locked in, and I mean locked in, well before the wedding ceremony. 
They were locked in from the time that they were betrothed. Now, you could say, should I think of this like an engagement? Um, maybe, maybe a little bit, but let's call it engagement on steroids. Engagement that is just as sure as the wedding commitment itself. But here's the deal. The whole time they were in this betrothal, they had not consummated the marriage. They weren't living together like, like man and wife do. But that relationship was solid. I think, I think back in uh, some of your day, the term would have been going steady on steroids. I have to say that because it's bigger than just going steady because uh, as, I, as I have heard the stories, there could be a guy who was going steady with three or four girls at the same time. Or unfortunately a girl who was going steady with, with different guys at the same time. That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about betrothal. We're talking about a solid commitment as certain and as secure as the marriage vow itself. And so what would often happen was they would come together, they would meet, they would express their love for one another, they would enter into this betrothal, the parents were aware of what was going on, uh, the, the bride-to-be and, the, and the bridegroom-to-be, they were aware of what was going on, but the bridegroom wasn't ready yet to have his own bride, and so what he had to do was he had to depart from her for a time to go and make things ready. He had to build a house. He had to make sure he had a secure source of income and things like that. By the way, this is just Bible truth. If a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. The Bible says if a man doesn't provide for his own household, he's worse than an infidel. Men, God's created us to be workers and providers and to lead in our homes. That's just, it's just solid Bible truth. It's God's way and it works. And so what, what, uh, what he's doing here is he's, he, he enters into this betrothal with her. They express their love for one, one another, but they are not at the point of consummating that relationship. And that's why, the, that's why the request is made to the daughters of Jerusalem. There are things in this relationship that are not to be awoken until time for them to be awoken. Or woken up. Waken up. Waked. Whatever that word is. I think you're with me. Just leave, leave that alone until it's time. I'm telling you, that's a Bible truth. Especially young people in here. Hear that as a Bible truth. It'll help you. It'll protect you. It'll guard your heart. It'll guard your life. There are some things that are only reserved for marriage, and in marriage they're wonderful. But outside of marriage, they just cause chaos and confusion, all kinds of problems. And so he, he just says here, she just makes this request, daughters of Jerusalem, you're my help on this. Let's not wake up certain things until time for them to wake up. Because why? They're in this betrothal. And then the next thing you know, Look in chapter 3, verse number 1. In chapter 3, verse number 1, it says, By night on my bed I sought him whom my soul loveth. So now she's, she's got this seeking, she's got this longing. Uh, she says, I sought him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the broad ways. I will seek him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. The watchmen that go about the city found me, to whom I said, Saw ye him whom my soul loveth? It was but a little that I passed from them, but I found him whom my soul loveth. So watch what happens here. Let's just follow the timeline here from chapter to chapter. She expresses a longing for a deep, intimate relationship, but she sees herself as unworthy of such an intimate relationship. But he doesn't see her the same way. He sees her through the eyes of love and expresses how fair she is and that he wants her for his own and they become betrothed in a relationship that is not yet consummated, but it's a sure thing. They are an item at this point and they talk to each other like they're an item. But then he goes away and he's not there. And she's looking for him, but she doesn't just sit around the house looking for him. 
She's got to go on with daily life. Where's she at? She's out in the streets. She's going about her way. She's doing the things that she needs to do. But while she's doing her business out in the streets, she's looking for him to come at any time. Until one day, she looks up. And here he comes. The one that her soul loveth. The one that she's entered into relationship. The one that she is betrothed to. She looks up and here he comes. And the Bible says in, in verse number 4, It was but a little that I passed from them. In other words, it wasn't, it wasn't as long as it seemed like it was. It didn't take as long as, as it seemed like it was. Have you ever been in a situation where you're really looking for something to happen? You're excited about something that's coming, and man, it seems like time passes so slowly until, it, until what you've been expecting gets there, and then you're like, man, that went by quick. Well, I tell you, a, long, a longing can really stretch out the perception of time. But, but all of that... All of that length disappears when the hope comes, when that expectation is fulfilled. She says, but I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please. There's that, there's that uh, plea again. Uh, verse number 6. Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all powders of the merchant? In other words, man, when he comes, this is a to-do right here. She says when he shows up, it's a, it's a display. He comes out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, and he smells good. This poetic language here. You're going to talk about, if, if a woman's going to talk about longing to be with a guy, there's just something where she kind of hopes he smells good. Guys, did you get that? I don't understand why my wife doesn't want to be around me. Well, come on, be honest with yourself. You don't want to be around yourself sometimes. You, uh, she, she says, man, who is this coming out like pillars of smoke and he smells good and he's got all powders from the merchant on i mean this guy's cleaned up and he's he's fixed up and he's ready verse 7 behold his bed which is solomon's three score valiant men are about it of the valiant of israel now she's not talking about like a bed in a bedroom here she's talking about she she looks out here and she sees this procession she sees this big to do and there's 60 men surrounding valiant men and they're surrounding these guys that are carrying this couch or this bed. Think ancient times here. What they would do with people of honor. As a matter of fact, this guy is of great honor because she said, I noticed that this bed that was coming, this is Solomon's bed. Um, three score valiant men are about it of the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords, be an expert in war. Every man hath his sword upon his thigh because of fear in the night. King Solomon made himself a chariot of the wood of Lebanon. He made the pillars thereof of silver, the bottom thereof of gold, the covering of it of purple, the midst thereof being paid with love for the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O ye daughters of, of Zion, and behold King Solomon with the crown wherewith his mother crowned him in the day of his espousals and in the day of gladness of his heart. So here's what I want to point out to you. This, and this is so good. If you remember this, back in chapter 1, verse number 7, when she meets him the first time, do you remember who he is? Do you remember what he's doing? He's a shepherd. And she's asking, where do you keep your flocks? When she fell in love with him, he was a shepherd. When she longed for that intimate relationship with him, we could say it like this, there was no form or comeliness that she should desire him. Shepherds were the lowest class of people there were. But she saw something in him that was different 
than anyone else who offered to love her or offered to have, have an intimate, deep relationship with her. And, and while, he was, while he was in the form of a shepherd, she, she fell in love with him. While he was a shepherd, she was betrothed to him. And then he goes away. But when he comes back, guess what? He's not a shepherd anymore. She didn't go and betroth herself to a shepherd all along. She's actually now betrothed to the king. When he, when he shows up the first time in chapter 1, he shows up meek and lowly. But when he shows up the second time to come get her, he's a king. Y'all seeing this? I mean, it's just right there. Can I tell you about our Savior? Can I tell you about Jesus Christ, the one who died for us on the cross? Do you realize He's already been here once? But when He came the first time, He didn't come down as a king. He came down meek and lowly. He came down born uh, in a stable and laid in a manger and wrapped in grave clothes. That's what swaddling clothes are. He was wrapped in, gla- in, in grave clothes and, and laid, in a man- laid in a manger. How foreshadowing is that? That even at his birth, he's wrapped in grave clothes. And Isaiah 53 said he had no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. We did esteem him smitten of God and afflicted. As a matter of fact, he came unto his own and his own received him not. National Israel rejected him. Why? Because they were expecting the king to come. They weren't expecting one to come meek and lowly. They weren't expecting a virgin birth. They weren't expecting somebody born in the little bitty town of Bethlehem to be their Messiah. They weren't expecting someone who would then move to Nazareth of all places and, be, and grow up in a carpenter's home in Nazareth. They weren't expecting a little toddler who would go, go off to Egypt for a few years before he would come back don't, don't they know that going into Egypt would have defiled that young man? The Messiah never would have gone into Egypt, but he did. And the deal is, when he came, he came meek and lowly. He came as lowly as a shepherd. As a matter of fact, his coming was first announced. To who? To shepherds. To shepherds on a hillside. Watching their flocks. And in coming meek and lowly, he was rejected by his own people. And after about 33 years, his own people, the religious leaders of his own people, would hate him so desperately and want him gone so bad that they would stand outside of Pilate's judgment hall and cry, Crucify him! Crucify Him! And everything that Jesus went through was the will of God and necessary because the wages of sin is death. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if we were going to ever be saved and reconciled to God, Jesus, a perfect man, had to die substitutionally for the sins of the whole world. And that's exactly what he did. And then they buried him in a borrowed tomb. Three days later, by his own power, he rose up alive from that grave. Forty days after that, he ascended back to the Father. And do you remember what he told his disciples before he went? He said, I'm going away, but I'm coming back for you. As a matter of fact, he even used Eastern marriage language in what he said to his disciples the night before he died. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be 
also. And he gave that promise. So watch what happens. We're not talking about a nation anymore, like the nation of Israel. We're not talking about the United States of America. We're talking about you. We're talking about me as an individual. As an individual born into this world, the son of Joe and Denise Decker, I was born with a sin nature that I got from my father. You say, that's not very nice to talk about your dad like that. Well, he got a sin nature from his dad. And by the way, so did you. We're all sinners. We all do things that displease God. We all break God's laws. And I was born with a sin nature, but there was something in my heart that longed for a right relationship with a true and living God. There was something in me that wanted to to know this God who created everything and He must have created everything because this couldn't happen by accident. This couldn't just come about on its own. There has to be an infinite designer. And there's this desire in our hearts. There was a desire in my heart. I would love to know this God, but my conscience says you can't know this God because you've sinned against Him. You're separated from this God. He's holy. He's righteous and you are not. And, and, and so as much as I long for a, des- a relationship with God, when I looked at myself, I saw who I really was. A slave to sin separated by my own sinful choices and decisions from a God who is holy and righteous. But I'm happy to tell you, He looked beyond my sin and saw somebody He loved. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Do you see? Jesus laid down his life for us because he loved us and he knew who we were. He knew what we've done and what we will do. And he still loved us in spite of that. He still looked at each one of us as an individual and saw us as the fairest among all because he sees something we can't see in ourselves. We see ourselves as unworthy We see ourselves as a sinner separated from God. But He sees us through a love that can only originate from He Himself. And that love caused Him to give His life for us on Calvary's cross. And when I realized that, when I accepted who I was as a sinner and trusted His love and what He demonstrated on Calvary, He forgave me of my sin. He gave me an earnest of a relationship with Him by sending His Holy Spirit to live within me. And now we are in a betrothed relationship. Oh, it's not full. It's not complete. As a matter of fact, I've only seen Him through the eyes of faith. I've never laid physical eyes on Him. But each and every day I find myself going about my business, out in the streets. And I'm thinking about what I'm doing, or at least trying to. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, is today the day He's coming back? He said He would come. He said He would come for me. He said that He was preparing a place for me. Is today the day He's coming back? And I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing here right now, The day is coming when Jesus is coming back for me. But when He comes, it won't be like the first time. When He comes, it will not be meek and lowly like a babe in a manger. That was the first time. When He comes again, He's not coming back like that. As a matter of fact, when He comes back again in power and great glory... He's coming back with a vesture dipped in blood that reads across it, King of kings and Lord of lords. He comes to make war with His enemies. And if you think it's going to be a long drawn out fight, it will not be. Because He defeats them instantly with a word that proceeds out of His mouth. I'm just telling you, this picture in just the first three chapters alone 
in Song of Solomon shows us, we're that Shulamite maiden that looks at herself and says, I'm so unworthy. So unworthy of His love. But we see Him who sees beyond our faults to someone He dearly loves, to someone who, who makes a promise to us that He's going to leave and He's going to come back and He's going to receive us unto Himself. All of that's in the first three chapters of Song of Solomon, but it's a picture of what's in all four Gospels and every New Testament letter that tells us what the plan of salvation is all about. Jesus came for sinners. He died for sinners. He went away. He's coming back. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I love that part in chapter 3 when he comes back as king and she lays hold of him and this is what she says, I will not let him go. You know what she's saying? Wherever he's at from now on, that's where I'm going to be. And there's coming a day, that's how it's going to be for us as well. You realize, even though we are sinners, God loves us so much. God loved us so much, He sent Jesus to be our Savior and die on the cross for our sins. And you say, well then preacher, how do I know that my sins are forgiven? How do I know that I have eternal life? How do I know that He's involved in my life on a day-to-day basis? How do I know that I have relationship with Him? Here's what the Bible says about that. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It comes right down to this. God said that He provided salvation and relationship with God in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus did everything that's necessary for us to be forgiven and for us to have fellowship with God. If you'll receive that by faith, if you'll take God at His word and believe that, God will forgive you of your sin. And you can have that relationship with God to know, I might not know what all's going on in my life, but I know God's in control. And I know He's got a plan. And I know He's got a purpose. And every day I'm going to go to His Word and I'm going to read His Word to find out what He wants from me. And every day I'm going to spend time in prayer and I'm just going to try to line my heart up with His heart and line my will up with His will. And I'm telling you, we have the opportunity because of what Jesus Christ did to have an intimate relationship. I'm not talking about physically, but a spiritually intimate, deep relationship with the Creator God and not through a priest or not through some man or some woman, but directly, one-on-one. Because of Jesus, I can go to God directly in prayer and know that He hears my prayer. And I can watch Him answer my prayer. He might not answer it every time in the way that I request it, but He does answer prayer because He does know what's best for us. And He's a loving God who created us to have fellowship with Him. We messed it up by sin, but He saw past the sin to an opportunity for us to be reconciled to God once again. And if you haven't if you haven't known forgiveness of sin in your life, if you haven't known what it's like to know that longing with an intimate relationship with God fulfilled in your own heart, I I beg you, trust Jesus as your Savior today. Just real quick and I'm done. I want you to know these verses. I want you to know this stands on the Word of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages, that's what we earn, that's what we deserve, the wages of sin is death. Death is what every one of us deserve, and death means separation. We deserve to be separated from God for all eternity because of our sinful choices. Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth His love, that word commendeth means shows. He shows His love toward us 
in that while we were yet sinners, before we knew about Him, before we cared about Him, before we knew what He had done for us, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He took, what, he took our wages. He took what we deserved. He took that on Himself and He died for us. So that the rest of Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God took our punishment that we deserve. That's called mercy. And God offers the gift of forgiveness that we don't deserve. That's called grace. And God, by His mercy and grace, has provided salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10, verse number 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. That word ashamed means disappointed. Whosoever believes on him will not be disappointed. Why? It's real. Verse 13. For whosoever, anybody, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not maybe, not I hope so, but whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 1 John chapter 5. These things are written that ye may know that ye have eternal life. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It's that simple. God's taken the complex issue of sin, forgiveness, salvation, and He's made it as simple as this. Would you trust in my Son and what He's done? And if you will, you're saved, forgiven, set free. You have a relationship with me because of Jesus. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. We're going to have a time of invitation this morning. Just a time to respond if God's spoken to your heart. Maybe you here this morning... You've heard the message from God's Word and you realize I need to accept the one who loves me. I need to accept the one who loved me so much that He gave His life for me on Calvary's cross. I need to trust in Him. Would you admit this morning that you're a sinner, you've done things we all have that have displeased God and that we need forgiveness from those sins? And if God's spoken your heart about that today, this is a wonderful time to just say, yes, Lord, I, I want to accept the salvation that you've offered as a free gift. I believe that I can't earn it. I believe that I can't buy it. But Lord, I just want to accept it from your gracious and merciful hand as a gift. That's how much he loves us. He gives out forgiveness. He gives us eternal life because He loves us that much. At great cost to Him but at no cost to us. Just a matter of receiving it. Heavenly Father, I pray that You'd speak to hearts this morning. And God, if You've stirred a heart about their need for salvation, their need for forgiveness of sins and eternal life, Lord, I pray that You'd give them the courage to step out in this invitation and Come to this altar and somebody can take God's word in which you cannot lie. Show them how they can leave here today knowing that all sin, past, present, and future is forgiven. And that they have a personal relationship with a loving God who cares very much for us. Lord, uh, I pray that uh, if there's other areas of our life that you've spoken to someone's heart about, that, Lord, if they need to respond this morning, you'd give them the courage to step out and come. And, Lord, please bless this invitation time in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me?